Okay. All right, well, anyway, let me start by thanking um, Kepa for inviting me and, of course, John Perry um, uh, for, for also for, uh, you know, he's um, allowing me to be here, to, to, um, which is an honor for me. Um, I was realizing now that I was a student at Stanford, and uh, so I've known John Perry for well over 30 years now. Um, I mean, actually, John Perry was John Echemendi's advisor, and John Echemendi was my advisor, which makes me a kind of a granddaughter of John Perry, and then it makes me feel much younger. No, no, never mind that then John Echemendi had a child, an intellectual child, at the age of five, right, or something like that. Anyway, um, so um, let me see. Um, I, I need to start with two clarifications. I, I, I read the, the lectures uh, some time ago. I, I, I took a lot of notes, and I thought, I, I'm just going to just have a few notes here, and I'm not going to have any presentation, nor I'm going to read, because, I mean, it's so much more lively when you can talk from the top of your head. I wasn't counting that I was coming from, I just arrived last night from Toronto, and after not sleeping for 35 hours, and uh, then sleeping for three hours tonight, this morning I got up and I looked at my notes, and I thought, what is this? What did I mean to say here? So anyway, you, I'm not going to make any effort of integrating this into something coherent. I'm just going to try to go through the notes and see what happens. Um, another clarification is that there are people here in the audience, but, uh, but, but among the speakers, um, that have analyzed and criticized and developed John's, the details of John's theory much more than, than myself, like, you know, Isidora and uh, Francois and Eros and Stacy and Kepa himself. So what I'm, I would like to do is just focus on issues that are, in some ways, they are suggested in the lectures, and I think that they are also suggested throughout John's work. Uh, there are themes that appear time and again. So I want to focus on on something that I view more like some general, some framework issue, some general approach to language and meaning and the complicated relation between language and the world and the mind. And um, I'm not clear that which what I'm going to say is some issues that John will agree that are important. Probably this is a little bit of wishful thinking. All right, I wanted to start with the initial example of seeing a woman on TV. Let me just go and get the... the review. Um, John went through this, but let me read what he uh, says. Now, suppose I see an interview with a Syrian refugee in a Turkish camp on television. I can think and talk about that person. I can make conjectures, like she's from Damascus, whose truth or falsity depend on her origins. I can think about her, not only as I watch the program, uh, but days and years from now when I wonder what happened to her. I don't actually see her. What I see is an image on my television screen. That image appears on my screen because of a complex connection that goes something like this. A camera in Turkey is aimed at the refugee. The image is fed to a transmitting station in a nearby truck, and from there to CNN headquarters in Atlanta. And from there, one way or another, to Comcast, and then via their cable to my television set. These more basic physical relations make it possible for me to think about and refer to the refugee. Um, I think that this example um, tells us several things about the relation of reference, suggests a lot of things about the, the relation of reference, the relation between a word and an expression that makes it possible to, uh, for us to talk about that expression. Um, see, first of all, the process by which I can say something as simple as I saw a woman on TV is a very complicated process. That's what, the, that's what John brings up. There's lots of intermediate steps. There are a lot of brute physical facts, um, also non-brute facts 
um, having to do with conventions, expectations. For instance, if, we, if the image was of the, of the footsteps of that woman, we wouldn't say that I saw an interview of that woman on TV, even if the footsteps are so causally related to the woman as probably some of the pixels that we see on TV. So there's a lot of brute facts and non-brute facts, conventional facts, expectations, and so on. Um, now, we describe the relation as seeing a woman on TV directly, in a way that it's not mediated. Um, and in fact, the point is that it would be incorrect to describe that relation in, by, by not to describe it in an immediate way. So it's not because we don't know enough about the processes that bring this image on TV, that we describe it as a case of, I saw a woman on TV. Right? Is that it would be incorrect to substitute a description of the whole process for the, for the, for the expression, I saw a woman on TV. Right. Um, so in that, in that sense, I think that sometimes you hear people that are that are eliminativists, and they, and they get it wrong. They get the levels wrong. I mean, you, you cannot, the, the description has to be this direct description of the relation, even if the relation is very complicated. Now, this is a little bit like, um, to put another example, the relation mother-child or father-child um, has a lot of physical, facts that make it possible, right? Um, and in the, case of, in the case of adoptive parents, it has physical and, 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 and conventional and, and non-brute facts, right? Um, to put it another way, the mechanics that brings the relation about has a lot of complicated steps, but it is a direct relation, the relation of being a father of. Mm -hmm in a way in which the relation of being a cousin or being a father-in-law is not, is not direct. The levels of complications are different. So to me, John's example, what suggests is that reference is also a relation that is direct and complicated. <laughs> it's a direct and complicated type of relation. It is direct, humans have, because humans have developed the capacity of making pieces of the world, either marks on a blackboard or sounds. Um, humans have developed the capacity of making those pieces of the world stand for other pieces of the world. Um, John Perry often says that um, cave people invented names so that they could call their children to dinner. Right? Um, but the mechanics may be very complicated of what makes a name stand for a thing. And we shouldn't make the mistake of substituting a description of the mechanics for the words refers to. Um, now, people who defend this approach about the directness of reference, I defend it. I don't know how much John defends it. I think that he does too. Um, I thought that I learned it from him, so I hope that I wasn't wrong. Uh, people who defend this approach about the directness of reference relation, they often face the, ma the magic objection, right? That's leveled. It's just the idea is that. So you're just saying that reference, I mean, it's just something that does it happen by magic? Right? There's, no, there's, the, there's no mechanism, there's no explanation that we can give. Does it happen by magic? The answer is no, it doesn't happen by magic. It happens because of a host of very complicated intermediary physical and conventional facts. But those facts contribute to establishing the relation, and they're not going to provide an analysis of it. Um, okay, this, viewing things like this, I think, leads to two other considerations. One of them is the following. I think that for many years, when we have been attending to the discussions that spring from Kripke's and Donnellan's original anti-descriptivist stance, I think that for many years we've got the dialectic wrong. Um, um, we had this view, like the, the descriptivist view, 
of how reference is fixed, the descriptivist view of the mechanism of reference. And then Kripke and Donnellan came along and proposed something that was closer to Mill. And we have viewed this as proposing, as that they proposed an alternative. Um, let me just say, I mean, the, I'm calling it Millian because Mill is the inspiration for this view. Um, Mill said some things um, that actually are not that inspirational. Mill said that names have no connotation. They have only denotation and no connotation. That's false. I mean, men, men, names have um, lots of connotations. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know anybody who has called their children or one of their child, children Caligula. And that's because, because of the connotations of the name, right? Um, so the point is that the connotations do not determine the reference. Um, Mill used the example of Dartmouth. And he said something that I think it's also wrong. It's very inspirational, but it's also wrong. He said, we call the city Dartmouth because it was at the mouth of the Dart. But no matter how much the river changed course, if it were to change course, we would, con we would continue to call it Dartmouth. Now, who knows what we would do? Humans are unpredictable. That's a prediction about what we would do. That's not the point. The point is that if the river were to change course and we continue to call the city Dartmouth, we would still be talking about the city. In fact, one can say even something stronger. If it turned out that the city was never at the mouth of the Dart, there was a, some kind of hallucination, just the fact that that's its name would make us, allow us to talk about it, okay? So, that's just the point about the million view. So, the point about the dialectic is that we, Kripke and Donnellan, I, don't, I think that they're not proposing an alternative theory of the mechanism of reference, of the determination of reference, that is at the same level as the paradigm that they were trying, that they were trying to debunk. Um, the descriptivist is, an, is providing an analysis of reference, is giving us a proposal for the mechanism of the how it happens, the intermediate steps. Um, the million is more at the level of, I saw a woman on TV. Right? Um, but it should, have, it should have been obvious that we were wrong about the dialectic because it should have been obvious that Kripke and Donnellan's criticisms to the theory that they were trying to debunk do not provide a positive alternative to the theory. Um, the causal change of communication is not a reference determining mechanism. The causal chain is not what determines the reference. If you think about that, the, the, the chain is actually a mechanism of preservation and propagation of meaning, of linguistic function. It explains how generations use language roughly in the same way as the previous generations, and I say roughly because there are changes, mistakes that give rise to new users, like the Madagascar case, um, but the preservation is of something that already was there. Words are used with the same meaning they had, and names are used to refer to the same individuals they referred. Now, if we were Martian anthropologists looking at the whole chain of communication, we would get back to the introduction of the name. We wouldn't get back to the referent. And the question about how does it happen? Does it happen by magic that you just point at something and dub it? The question would still be there, right? Um, actually, I think that there was one person that realized that the dialectic was wrong. Uh, it was Ruth Barkin Marcus. And there's this famous story, according to which there was a conference, and then you had some Phrygians and descriptivists and, and, uh, and, and, and followers of Kripke, and they were arguing about the mechanism of reference. And of course, the descriptivists were saying to the other guys, look, guys, I mean, you're just leaving the explanation unfinished because you're not giving us a mechanism of reference. We have a mechanism of reference. The description does it, but you guys are not giving it to us. And, uh, and the Kripkeans were concerned about that. And then from the back of the room, Ruth Marcus uh, raised her voice and said, mechanism of reference, mechanism of reference. There's no mechanism of reference. Names are the long finger of extension. <laughs> 
So I think that she saw it immediately clearly that the dialectic was wrong in that sense. And it's unfortunate that the chain of communication picture continues to be presented as a theory of determination of the reference. For instance, nowadays, uh, many people do that, and nowadays that things have gotten, from my point of view, a little worse, because experimental philosophers are doing all these probes, trying to pit descriptivism and, I don't, the, and the causal theory of the determination of reference, and they're contributing a lot to the Confucians. Many Confucians, this is one of them. So this is what I wanted to say about the dialectic between the so-called new theory of reference and other theories that propose mechanisms of reference, Frege's theory of sense, descriptivism, or neo-descriptivism, any of them. Now, another consideration suggested by John's example of seeing a woman on TV is that once we see the dialectic properly and the theoretical level at which the million is operating, we have to leave the door open, and I think that John is sympathetic to this. I mean, we have to leave the door open to the possibility that all those intermediate steps of the mechanism, of the mechanics of reference, are not steps that philosophers can say much about. That is an empirical, non-conceptual matter, how that complicated process gets in place. That is something that, you know, anthropologists and physicists maybe and neuroscientists must, may tell us something about but we as philosophers cannot say much more um, let me make some clarifications first of all first clarification when I say that it may be an empirical matter I do not mean that it is to be settled in the way in which experimental philosophers are going about these days trying to settle um, these issues between one and another theory by giving people, um, um, giving people some um, vignettes and asking them. Among other things, because in my view, their, their, their research, or whatever you want to call it, um, does not show anything about how people, how speakers use names. Um, if it shows anything at all, it shows something about what kind of theory of reference the people are more inclined to accept. So when I say that it's an empirical matter, I don't think that it's going to be settled that way. Um, when I say, another qualification is that when I say that the intermediate steps of the mechanics of reference are not steps that philosophers can say much about, I do not mean, I do not mean that philosophers should stop reflecting about language and about reference and about meaning. In fact, I mean, I mean we're philosophers. Nobody's going to stop us to talk about these things. Um, um, philosophers think a lot and have a lot of, of things to say, for instance, about vision and perception. But that does not mean that we have anything to, do about the, anything to say about the mechanics of vision. Right? So it will be still interesting for us to think um, how these relations between words and things contribute to uh, cognitive issues and mental issues and, and there are a host of epistemic issues that we're going to continue talking about. But it may happen that the, the mechanism of reference is now taken out of our hands. And I'm just, I see that with, a, I say that with a little bit of regret because that's, that's the one thing that I've dedicated my life to talk about and I'm just putting myself out of a job. But I think that we are there and we are getting there. So in the case of reference, I think that what may happen is that many things that we think are conceptual turn out not to be conceptual after all. Um, for instance, Aristotle said a lot of things about causation that we still discuss nowadays. Uh, he also said something about the hylomorphic co-principles of everything in nature. And he also said things about um, the trajectory of projectiles. Right? Probably there were lots of things that seemed conceptual about the trajectory of the project tiles, and they were not. So I, I think that we may be getting to that particular point. So that's the one thing in which perhaps is wishful thinking, but I, all these things are suggested to me by John Stans over the years. Let me just um, raise um, two concerns about something that John said in these lectures. I had also some concerns about um, about, Milton, about the roles and so on, but, but uh, already um, Stacy said um, 
everything that I had thought and, 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 and many, many, many more interesting things, so I'm going to refrain here. Um, I have some concern um, that I'm, I know that I'm, I have some concern about, the, uh, let me put it like this, I know that it's going to sound very biased. Um, see, the thing is that um, it's, um, David Kaplan once told me um, that there are some people who do philosophy of language slash mind. But you do, Genoveva, you do philosophy of language slash out the mind. And <laughs> he was telling me this when he was trying to convince me that I was not going to be very happy if I moved to England. Um, so anyway, he was right about that. So anyway, so John is very interested in the mind. Um, and uh, I just, <laughs> and I just, um, my concern is that I see too close a connection in his writings between referring to and, and thinking about. Like in the lectures, the, this comes constantly, and, and it comes in passing, right? What allows me to refer to Aristotle and to, and to think about and things like that. Um, I'm concerned because, um, it's a matter of principle. I think that what we refer to depends on conventions, and we exploit those conventions to think about things. Um, and also it's true that we, our minds in a sense, are collectively responsible for the existence of those conventions. But institutions governed by conventions have a bit of a life of their own. And I was thinking about cases in which, um, see, it's not so clear that we want the referring to thinking about go hand in hand. If I imagine that I enter a room, I see a person coming out of a room, let's call it A. Then I enter the room and there are these people having a conversation and everybody's using Bill. And so I join the conversation thinking that they're talking about this person that I just saw leaving the room. And I, I just, I become part of the conversation. I become part of the network. And, and I start, and at some point I say things like, uh, Bill looked like he was sick or something like that. Now, it seems to me that this is one of these cases in which um, it's rather clear that, to me at least, that I'm thinking about A. It's much less clear to me that I'm referring to A given that there is a set convention of calling Bill, Bill, and A is not Bill. Right? This is a little bit like the kind of Madagascar case that, that Stacy was, was raising now. Um, in fact, I would go, as I, say, as I said, it's not clear to me that I'm referring, uh, uh, it's clear that I'm thinking about A, it's not clear that I'm referring to A. I would say something stronger. I would say that it's clear to me that I am referring to Bill because I'm part of that network, but that is not. So now many people um, take a view according to which they try to convince us that um, I'm also thinking about Bill. Just by virtue of having joined that conversation, I'm also thinking about, I have the referential intention to talk about whoever it is that is the individual that is the referent of, uh, or that is the bearer of the name Bill and David Kaplan would per perhaps present this nowadays as a case of transmission of the having in mind and things of that nature, but to me it's not clear at all. And there are those cases in which it seems to me that there's a virtue that we want to preserve, that we may, may want to think about something, or that, and that we in fact, or that we are thinking about something, and that in fact we are referring to something that we did not intend to refer, did not have in mind, were not thinking about. You know, language has a life of its own, and people use words um, in a way that they didn't know that they, they, what they meant or what they referred to. One final minor point, and I think that this is not very important, but there was something that surprised me how much in the lectures John um, uh, appeals to possible worlds. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is part of the wanting to establish a, con a connection with the diagonal proposition of two-dimensionalism, which, from my point, is a big mistake, because, uh, I, but I'm not going to go into this. I mean, I think that John's view is, is very different from two-dimensionalism. So this surprised me, uh, because 
in one case in particular, particularly when you think about general terms or natural kind terms, right? Um, and you want to think, in order to explain cognitive matters, uh, you want to think about situations in which you have something that is called gold, uh, that looks like gold and feels like gold and behaves pretty much like gold, but it's not gold because it doesn't have that atomic number. And, you know, who is to say that that is a possible world? Uh, specifically, depending on what nature and essence is and your views on nature and essence and the connection between underlying properties and superficial properties and superficial behavior, that may be, you may be describing something here that is not a possible world. I don't think that John has ever been a very good friend of possible world semantics, so I don't think that this is a minor point, but I think that I must confess that the, that the um, appeal to possible worlds surprised me. So, and I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. So now we take another 10 minutes break. So we'll be back at 5, 15, 16. Great.